uh, sir, you can start the session. All right. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing all right during this uh, pandemic at your respective places. By the way, uh, can everybody hear me? Can anyone confirm from the chat box or maybe unmute yourself and confirm? Okay, okay, great. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, before we get into the main webinar, I would like to thank Mr. Joshi from Scholar Gate for inviting me to deliver a webinar on SRP, uh, Introduction to the Sakar Road Pump. And I want to thank everyone who are attending the webinar as well. I really hope I meet your expectation at the end of the webinar. Okay, now uh, let me just quickly introduce myself. My name is Lel Nuntuanga, and this is how you pronounce it. I completed my bachelor in petroleum engineering, and I have about three years of experience. And like many of you, I'm also under my learning stage. I work in ONGC as an artificial leaf executive uh, under specialist school and mainly we are dealing with the uh, liquid loading problem in gas wells and today I will be delivering some of the many things that I've learned and experienced during the last three years in ONGC. Okay now without further ado let's jump right in. This will be our outline for today's webinar. Uh, we'll look into the sucker root components, uh, sucker root pump components, pump selection and uh, sucker root string design, the surface unit, as well as uh, uh, what are the monitoring tools for SRP uh, once the well is completed with uh, SRP. I believe uh, most of us already familiar with the production system, right? Uh, the reservoir, the well board, the well head, flow line separator. But I'll take just uh, one slide for a quick recap. Usually, whether an oil well or gas wells uh, in its early stages in their production lights, they flow naturally from the reservoir and then from the reservoir to the well bore from the well bore well to the well head and then separator via your uh, flow line, right? So when this uh, fluid flows, basically it's because uh, there is a pressure difference, right? So when a well is producing or flowing naturally, which means that the pressure at the bottom of the well is sufficient to overcome the total or the sum of the pressure losses occurring along the tubing. And maybe, maybe not just the tubing, the well head, the flow line. So in short, we can say that the pressure losses along the flow path to the separator. And when this criterion is not met, the natural flow, the self flow ends, and then they, the wells eventually dies, right? So this means what? It means that the well, the flowing bottom hole pressure drops below the total pressure losses in the well or the pressure losses in the wells become greater than the bottom hole pressure, which uh, we actually needed to unload fluids uh, to the surface. Here I put one uh, plot which gives you the pressure losses and its location starting from the reservoir uh, till your uh, separator. Now comes the artificial leaf. Why do we need the artificial leaf system or the artificial leaf method? So these artificial leaf methods are used to, to produce fluids from, from the wells uh, that are already dead or to increase the production rate from the flowing wells. The main objective here is uh, using uh, the artificial leaf uh, system is to uh, obtain a higher production rate from, from your well by increasing the, uh, the, the production pressure drawdown. Uh, I put here the J or the productivity index for easy representation because of the relationship between your drawdown and, uh, uh, and the uh, production. Uh, if you also look at this IPR and the TPR curve here, uh, we can see that it's not overlapping or it's not intersecting. Right, so uh, this uh, in this case, if your well is showing like this kind of 
graph, you are going to need an artificial lift. Um, so basically this graph is showing uh, non-flowing wells. So in artificial lift system, uh, we have different methods such as your rod pump, your hydraulic pump, uh, ESP, electric submersible pump, gas lift, plunger lift, as well as your progressive cavity pump, the PCP. And of course, today we will be talking about the uh, basics of saccharot pump today. And now moving on to the saccharot pump. I think someone is uh, writing on the screen. I could not, yeah. Okay. Okay, in artificial lift, uh, let's start with the saccharot pump, the beam pump. It is also referred to as the beam pump. It is one of the most uh, commonly used artificial lift methods as well as one of the uh, oldest methods as well. And the, this SRP involves uh, the use of the downhole pump, basically a vertical positive displacement pump to increase the pressure in the well to overcome the, some of the pressure losses that occurs when the well fluids are flowing along the path from your well bore to the surface. And this SRP system can be broadly classified into three main uh, components such as your uh, surface surface unit uh, along with the wellhead system and uh, saccharot string uh, string and your subsurface pump which we will be going through one by one in the next slide now let's start from the bottom the subsurface pump the downhole pump uh, we can also call it the downhole pump and it works on the positive displacement principle. Okay, I actually I could not uh, disable this annotation. I don't know how. Okay, wait, let me just uh, try. Actually, I could not disable the annotation. Anyway, let's move on. So this downhole or the subsurface pump uh, works on the positive displacement principle and then this downhole pump okay uh, yeah, excuse me Okay, so this uh, downhole pump or the subsurface pump is installed in the tubing below the dynamic liquid level and it consists of a working barrel, uh, which is basically a cylinder and a plunger, uh, which is the piston and two ball and seat type valves, which are called the standing valve and the traveling valve. Excuse me, I have some issue. Okay, let me just clear my screen. I could not find my mouse, I don't know where. Actually, my computer screen is hang. I don't know how to disable this thing. Okay. I could not control anything, Mr. Nitin. not control it. Can you do something, Mr. Nitin? I could not control my screen.
Okay, okay. Now I'm back. I'll share it again. Okay, this time I will share my whole. Okay, my whole desktop, how will I share it? Okay, I will share. Okay, can 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 you see my screen? Nitin, can you see it? Hello? Yeah, it's it's visible, sir. Okay, okay, okay. So I can continue, right? So basically, these are the subsurface or pump or the downhole components, the working barrel, the plunger, and the two valves, which are the standing valve or the traveling valve. So let's start with the barrel. So your pump barrel or the working barrel is a stationary part of the subsurface pump. Uh, this green region is your pump barrel, uh, and it's going to be smaller than your uh, completion tubing. Uh, and then we have the lower and the upper extension. Uh, it is a pin or box connection. It will connect to the tubing. And this pump barrel length varies with the standard length up to 24 feet. And then inside this pump barrel, we have a plunger, which acts as a piston. And it is a moving part which will directly connect to the sucker rod string using your guide rod or your connecting rod. Uh, one thing here is that this is not a photo of a plunger. This is actually your insert pump type. Uh, and I could not find the plunger image from uh, internet or from my phone. Anyway, uh, this is your uh, insert pump type and the plunger uh, inside the barrel is connected to the uh, a rod string, so a rod string using this uh, guide rod and the connecting rod. And in this type, the working barrel or the plunger are in a, fixed together. One important thing to know uh, about the plunger or the pump barrel is that it's the clearance. So this is uh, between your inner diameter of the barrel or the outer uh, diameter of the plunger. So in deeper wells, usually depth greater than 50, uh, 5,000 feet or approximately 1,500 meter, the high hydrostatic pressure, uh, pressure above the plunger causes an excessive slippage of the fluids uh, uh, that you are lifting. So this will uh, fall back, passing the plunger, and then this will significantly reduce your uh, pump displacement and your uh, uh, displacement efficiency. So in order to maintain a high pumping efficiency, we need to keep this rate of slippage at uh, minimum. So uh, generally, this clearance or these fits uh, uh, ranges from 0 0.001 to 0 0.005 inches. And also it is designated as minus one, minus five feet. So selecting these plunger fits, uh, so in selecting these plunger fits, the liquid viscosity is one governing factor. Uh, the higher the viscosity, the lesser will be the slippage. And this pump slippage is also proportional to the length of the plunger. So now let's look at this general rule uh, for selecting the plunger length. When your pump depth is, uh, uh, less than 3,000 feet, three feet plunger will be sufficient. And for depth between 3,000 to 6,000 feet, uh, we need to add an extra one feet uh, per every 1,000 feet uh, with your three feet. And then for depth greater than 6,000 feet, uh, the, uh, your uh, six feet uh, plunger uh, are recommended. Okay, now moving on to the standing valve and the traveling valve. Uh, this is basically your API valve and uh, they are simply check valves and they are operating on a ball and seat principle. Uh, yeah, this is your ball and seat. And you will have two, uh, two valves. Uh, one is your standing valve that is located uh, below uh, your pump barrel uh, inside the extension part. Uh, inside your extension part, this standing valve, uh, lower extension, 
uh, your standing valve uh, is located and uh, your traveling valve is located inside the uh, inside the plunger uh, as the name suggests uh, the uh, this valve moves or travels along with the plunger uh, inside the pump barrel and both these uh, standing valves and the traveling valves are are uh, unidirectional uh, which means that both the valves uh, allow fluid to pass through them uh, in upward direction only so uh, if you uh, open this extension you you, you can see your ball and seat here okay moving on to the subsurface pump uh, basically there are two types of downhole pump or your subsurface pump one is an insert pump uh, or uh, it is also called a road pump and the other one is tubing pump so the main difference between these two is that uh, with the tubing pump the pump barrel is connected with the tubing and during installation of this tubing pump uh, and during lowering, uh, we have to run this pump along with the tubing. And so later on, we lower the plunger along with the sucker rod. So this is your uh, tubing pump. And for your uh, insert pump, uh, the whole plunger, uh, uh, the whole barrel and the plunger, uh, it is an integral part of the subsurface pump. So here we lower the pump catcher first along with the tubing. So after that, uh, we lower the sucker rod uh, along with your pump uh, and inside it, uh, there will be a plunger. So uh, we sit this subsurface pump on the pump catcher. So the main advantage of tubing uh, pump in, is that we can achieve uh, greater displacement compared to your insert pump. However, uh, if we want to service or repair the pump uh, without pulling out all the tubings, uh, uh, in case of insert pump, we can achieve that. So that will be the advantage of insert pump uh, over the tubing pump. And uh, the American Petroleum Institute, the API gives uh, some classification for the subsurface pump. And, uh, uh, if you want to give more details uh, towards this classification, you can check out this API specification 11AX. Anyway, uh, in this classification, uh, the first letter is your pump type, uh, uh, whether it's your tubing pump or rod pump, uh, T for your tubing pump and R for your rod pump. And the second letter gives you the type of burr. Uh, so it's either a heavy wall or thin wall. And one thing to know is that uh, the tubing pumps, uh, they come with a uh, uh, heavy wall barrel only. And also depending on the plunger type, uh, this heavy wall or the thin wall barrel designation will vary. So for example, uh, for your metal plunger, uh, your heavy wall is denoted as H and for your soft pack plunger, it will be denoted as P. And the third letter is for your rod pump only, Mm, which will give you the location of the seating assembly. A for your top anchor or your top hold down, B for your bottom hold down, bottom anchor, and T for your traveling bar barrel and the bottom hold, uh, bottom hold down. Also, this API gives a designation uh, to the pump, uh, which signifies uh, the following, such as your nominal tubings, size your pump size that's your bore size the pump type the barrel type and its location as well as the type of the seating assembly the barrel length your plunger length uh, as well as the length of your upper extension or the lower extension which is only for your heavy wall barrel now let's see uh, some exa uh, one example here uh, we have an api pump that is 25 uh, 175 rh am 1643. So what is this all the number and the letter uh, indicates? So this 25, that is your tubing size. This 25 uh, means that uh, your uh, the tubing size, that pump is for 27 by 8 tubing size. And 175 uh, will give you the pump size, the pump bore. Uh, 175 is your uh, 1.75 inches or 1, 3 by 4 inches. And then we have the next letter R. So this R is for rod pump, H for your heavy wall, and A is for your 
uh, top end cord and M for your uh, mechanical type uh, seating assembly. And the next, uh, that the seventh position, we have 16, that is your barrel length in feet. And at eight position, we have four number, uh, four, uh, which indicates your plunger length in four feet. And at last, we have the total length of extension, uh, three feet. So this could be uh, one feet upper extension plus two feet lower extension or two feet lower uh, upper extension plus one feet upper extension. So this three will be your total length of the extension. Now let's quickly look into the pump selection, the pump size. So while we are doing pump selection, many aspects must be considered. Uh, uh, like your well completion data, well geometrical data, or the special pumping condition, etc. So now let's have a uh, look at the casing, why the casing size is important. So it's mainly because your tubing size that you can use uh, is going to be limited by your casing size. And another thing about the tubing and the casing size is that with that uh, completion tubing or the casing size, your annulus between them varies, right? So uh, this available annulus will affect the gas handling. So the larger the casing, the more gas it can handle. And then the less gas will be passing through your uh, subsurface pump. So it is very important to look at the casing size. Similarly, uh, your tubing size will limit the size of the sucker rod that you can run uh, inside your uh, tubing. Uh, it's not exactly the uh, size of your sucker rod. Actually, it's your sucker rod uh, socket or uh, coupling size because the uh, sucker rod coupling uh, diameter is larger than the sucker rod size. Other than this, if you uh, consider using rod pump, uh, these are the rod pump type uh, maximum size. Uh, so if you are considered using uh, road pump, the size that you can run will also be uh, limited by your tubing inner diameter as well. And for the tubing pump, uh, what limits the tubing pump is that the outer diameter of the uh, extension, that is the box or pin connection, uh, uh, because this will connect to your tubing. Here we have a chart and table uh, here. It sh uh, this shows that the maximum table, the sucker rod, uh, maximum sucker rod size, as well as the tubing and uh, uh, road pump size. Uh, here I forgot to put uh, the casing size here, but you can check it out uh, the details later. Uh, I will be giving you the reference material uh, uh, at the end of the webinar. And now, uh, if we uh, see this uh, one uh, diagram here, uh, we have a five and a half inch casing. Uh, and in this five and a half ca uh, inch casing with a 4.95 uh, inch internal diameter, uh, the largest tubing size that we can run will be a, a three and a half inch tubing. Uh, but let's say we run two seven by eight tubing with uh, 2.441 inches. Uh, that's your uh, 6.5 PPF. The maximum size we can run uh, of the sucker rod coupling will be 1.812. Okay, now let's move on to the pump type selection. Uh, here we have a special operating condition uh, for different pump types. Like uh, if you want to achieve higher rate, uh, what type of pump should you use? And for deeper wells, uh, uh, as well as uh, a well experiencing high GLR or sand production scale paraffin. And uh, for, from this table, one thing is that uh, out of all these pump types, uh, the most advantageous features is with your road pump, uh, the stationary barrel top hole down road pump with uh, your API designations of RHA, RWA and RSA. And another thing to look at uh, during the pump type selection is your the allowable pump setting depth. Uh, since uh, the load uh, that acting against your pump barrel will be uh, vary with the pump setting depth uh, because uh, the pressure acting on the barrel during the upstroke and the downstroke changes with the pump depth as well as the fluid density. 
And you can check out this API recommended practice 11AR for details. Uh, in this case, pump allow, uh, allowable pump setting depths, we need to consider the burst, uh, the collapse, or the axial loads. Okay, uh, now coming to the sucker rod string, uh, which will connect the uh, surface pumping unit as well as the downhole pump. And this includes the uh, sucker rod uh, with its coupling, the crossover, the pony rods, sinker bar, and the polish rod. Uh, so let's have a look one by one here, uh, starting from the sucker rod. Uh, here I put the photo of the sucker rod. Uh, this is a solid steel rod, which is the most widely used sucker rod type. And the uh, sucker rod comes in uh, 25 feet or 30 or 35 feet in length as per the latest uh, API specification 11B. And the uh, rod diameter ranges from five by eight inches to one quarter inches uh, with an increment of one and a half inches. Uh, uh, not one and a half, one by eight inches. So if we have five and a half, uh, five by eight inches, Sucker rod. The next large, uh, larger size would be six by eight or three by four inches. Likewise, the size is having an increment of one by eight inches. And these sucker rod are joined together by the coupling, uh, which will connect. Uh, the coupling will connect the uh, same size of sucker rod and the crossover will connect different uh, different sucker rod sites. And uh, uh, this is a photo I took from uh, one of the well we completed with the uh, uh, SRP. Uh, we usually uh, kept this downhole equipment like your pump, sucker rod, sinker bar, pony rod, and polish rod at the well site before running in. And next we have pony rod. Uh, this is uh, same as your sucker rod, uh, only that this comes with shorter length, uh, such as uh, two, four, six, or eight feet in length. And this pony rod is mainly used for adjusting the sucker rod string at the top of the uh, top of the string. So, say for example, we have uh, we are running uh, sucker rod, and then after we take the bottom. Uh, since the, this sucker rod comes in 25 feet or 30 feet, it's not going to match uh, the wellhead uh, above the wellhead exactly at the top. So sometimes we need to uh, we uh, need to remove one or uh, two sucker rods, and then uh, we will be connecting uh, the string uh, with the pony rod, uh, maybe four feet, two feet, or a combination of uh, one of these. And then finally, we connect the string with the polish rod, and then uh, uh, we uh, hook up the polish rod to the surface unit. So at the top of the string, we have the polish rod. OK, now let's uh, uh, see the sucker rod string design. Uh, the main objectives in sucker rod string design is to determine uh, uh, what rod size to be used, uh, the length of the Individual taper, uh, individual taper section or the rod material to use. So uh, the ideal sucker rod string would be a continuous uh, tapered from top to the bottom of the string. So basically what this tapered means, uh, it means that we are using a different rod size, basically a smaller size downward or uh, an increasing diameter of the rod upwards. So for shallow depth, we may use straight root string that is a single size, or, but for uh, deeper wells, we require the taper root string because we want to uh, reduce the load, uh, loads of the sucker root string without uh, deteriorating the strength of the sucker root. Because uh, if the load, the load is increased, we need to use a bigger, a bigger surface unit. So that will cause more as well as we would require more power. So uh, the API has given an API code number, uh, as you can see in this table. Uh, so the road number uh, here, uh, having the same uh, number like 44, 55, 66, uh, uh, it will be a single road. Uh, so for example, 55 means uh, five, five by eight inch, uh, inches sucker, uh, sucker road. And for 66 means it will be three by four inch sucker road. 
And if we have a uh, soccer road uh, number like, like uh, 76 or 75, uh, so this is a, com a 76 would be a combination of seven by eight and the six by eight inches. So the API has given what would be the percentage of combination uh, with respect to the pump size as well. Now let's look at one example where we uh, are planning to set our uh, pump at 6,000 feet. Uh, uh, so if you want to find out how many soccer rod we need, uh, we can just divide the depth with the length of one soccer rod. So for 6,000 feet, we would require 240 numbers of soccer rod. So uh, uh, we decided to use the 76 combination and a pump size of 1.5 inches. So from the table, uh, we can look over to the rod number as well as the pump diameter 1.5 and move over here to the rod string percentage for seven by eight and three by four because we are using seven by eight as well as six by eight uh, soccer rod. So we can see that 33% uh, of 33.8% uh, of seven by eight and for three by four, it will be 66.2%. So out of the total, 81 numbers of seven by eight and 159 numbers of six by eight, we would require for uh, 6,000 feet depth. So that is how we are calculating the soccer rod combination. And another thing is that uh, if we look at the soccer rod uh, and its length to diameter ratio, we have a length of 25 feet, 30 feet, which is in feet. And if we see the diameter, it will be uh, seven by eight inches, or uh, if it's more, one inches, uh, one inches, something like that, right? So this length to diameter ratio is extremely large, right? So because of this, the soccer rod string uh, is prone to buckling. So this buckling is an unstable deflection of the rod uh, because uh, the rod string uh, is subjected to a compress a compressive uh, stresses above uh, some critical level. So when this rod buckle, they expose to high bending stress, uh, which could lead to immediate failure, or it will also shorten the fatigue life of the, uh, the sucker rod string. And one possible way to prevent this buckling is to uh, run a, a sinker bar uh, at the bottom of the rod section. So basically this sinker bar is a larger diameter of a sucker rod uh, that is placed above the, above the uh, downhole pump. And the length of the sinker bar section must be such that the weight of the sinker bar section should overcome the compressive load uh, that acts at the bottom of the string. So to calculate this, we have uh, formula. Uh, some company may use uh, different uh, uh, formula. Uh, and this sinker bar weight uh, required uh, will depend on the specific gravity of the fluid that we are going to unload, uh, the size of the pump that we are using, the type of the pump that we are using, as well as the pump depth. Anyway, we can calculate this uh, number of sinker bar using this formula. Let's say, for example, for the same 6,000 feet with the combination of 76 API, pump size of 1.5 inches, and say we have a sinker bar size, one quarter inches. So for 6,000 feet, we would require 11 number of sinker bar uh, calculated from uh, this uh, formula. So this pump factor uh, is basically calculated from the specific gravity as well as the pump type and the pump size. And similarly, the tubing string also subjected to varying load during the pumping cycle as well. So during downstroke, uh, the weight of the liquid uh, uh, that is carried by the plunger and, and uh, that will be carried by the plunger and during uh, downstroke, uh, load is transferred uh, from your plunger to the tubing, from, from your rod string to the tubing. So this uh, tubing will uh, be just hanged by the tubing hanger at the top. So during the pump cycle, the tubing 
uh, experiences some stretches or elongation and then they recoils. So to, emulate, uh, to eliminate this, the best practice is to anchor the tubing string to the casing uh, with the tubing anchor catcher. And this tubing anchor catcher are usually or normally placed 30 to 100 feet above the pump seating nipple. And uh, if we don't have the tubing anchor catcher available, another practice is that uh, we uh, used to uh, do is uh, uh, we used to add the uh, tubing an extra two singles or one tubing stand uh, below the subsurface pump but this will not eliminate the uh, tubing uh, stretch but it will uh, reduce the recoils as well as uh, the uh, it will be used for your natural gas anchoring basically that is for uh, separating gas and liquid downhole. Uh, so this extra uh, tubing that we add below the uh, subsurface pump will be called the tailpipe. And now, uh, what if our well is deviated? So uh, during saccharose string design, we will be also looking at the deviation profile. Uh, we will be looking at the dog leg severity, the, uh, the uh, inclination angle, uh, so this dog leg severity uh, will be one limiting factor uh, in deviated well. Like suppose if we have a, a dog leg severity from zero to three degree per hundred feet, there won't be any issue or any problem as, uh, as much. But as the dog leg severity becomes greater than three degree per hundred feet, we may use uh, road guides or roller guides. Uh, this is uh, your roller guides and this is your sucker rod with the uh, guide. And also for placing this uh, roller guide or the uh, rod guides, there are also a calculation, but I, I did not put it here because uh, there won't be any direct calculation. Uh, so uh, you, you can ask me later on and I will provide you the material if you want. So in deviated wells, uh, one solution is the a guide rod or the roller guide. And this is the sucker rod running in tools. Uh, we have the sucker rod elevator. Uh, usually we will be using two sucker rod elevators at the same time. And then this elevator will be hooked onto the sucker rod hook. And then for tightening the sucker rod, we are using sucker rod tongue or sucker rod wrench. Now coming to the surface, pumping unit. Uh, we have different types like uh, air balance pumping unit, Mark II or crank balance conventional pumping unit, and then we have the beam balance. So today we will be focusing on the most common pumping unit, the crank balance conventional uh, uh, pumping unit. Uh, this uh, pumping unit, usually the sucker rod pumping unit, the surface unit uh, will have lots of components like a horse head, walking beam, equalizer bearing, your crank arm, counterweight, and so on. Uh, it may be difficult to remember uh, at once, but you will get used to it. Okay, now let's look at the designation for this pumping unit. Uh, so to identify a pumping unit, uh, we, uh, the, uh, we need to consider the following, uh, the geometry, which is basically the unit type, and the uh, maximum torque capacity of the gear reducer, the gear reducer type like uh, double or triple reduction uh, and the structural capacity that is also your walking beam uh, load capacity and the maximum po uh, possible stock road uh, stroke length uh, that is available as well. So for example, we have uh, C456, D256 and 144 that is your unit uh, surface unit name. So what does all this indicate? Uh, so this C will stands for the crank balance conventional unit. Uh, it could be either C, uh, B, A, M, uh, or T, M. So B will be for your beam balance conventional unit. And the second one, four, five, six is for uh, the maximum torque capacity or the peak torque, which uh, will be in thousand inch pound. And this D will stands for the double gear reduction. 
and 256 is for the peak polish road load or the walking uh, beam uh, structural load, uh, which is in 100 pounds. And last, uh, we have 144, uh, that is the maximum possible stroke length we could achieve for that particular unit. So that uh, this will be in inches. And there will be uh, numbers of unit size and uh, structural data in uh, especially uh, uh, for the conventional unit given in the API uh, 11E. Okay, so when we completed the well with the subsurface pump, the sucker rod string, uh, we need to assemble the surface unit. So, uh, usually this, uh, the surface unit will come like this and we need to assemble it. Uh, so uh, uh, for me, this surface unit assembling is a very fun thing to do. Uh, it may require some physical work as well. Uh, and so once you assemble, the unit will be installed uh, at the well site. Uh, uh, it will be installed uh, near your well head uh, because uh, you need to hook up your second rod string. So there will be a, uh, a standard distance uh, for placing your unit uh, apart from your uh, well head center. So that is called a setback distance. Uh, it will depends on the unit size. And once you uh, place the unit, you hook up your sucker rod string uh, with your carrier bar, and then you are ready to operate the pump. So the simplest way uh, in explaining the downhole pumping operation uh, during the pump cycle is that uh, during downstroke, the traveling valve opens and then liquid goes into the plunger from the barrel. And then during upstroke, the standing valve opens and then the liquid is stuck into the barrel. Okay, so uh, now let's explain that downhole pumping uh, operation a little bit more technical. So basically we have three main pressure. One is uh, pump intake pressure, PIP, uh, that will be uh, at below the pump, uh, which relates to the casing pressure. And the second one is the pressure inside the chamber. And then that is basically the uh, pressure inside your barrel. And the third one is the pump displacement pressure or the pump discharge pressure, the PDP. And that is the pressure above the pump and it relates to the tubing pump. So during upstroke, when the uh, pump intake pressure uh, greater than the pressure inside the chamber, the fluid moves into the chamber then the, uh, as the standing valve opens, right? And then during downstroke, the fluid inside the chamber is compressed uh, to uh, pressure greater than the pump displacement pressure. And then once that happen, the travel, traveling valve open and then the liquid, uh, the liquid moves up. So uh, this is the formula uh, for the pump intake pressure and the uh, pump displacement pressure. So how will you know that the production uh, coming from your SRP well? Uh, we can calculate using this formula. So once you install the a pump and a surface unit, the main parameter uh, you can change to optimize your production is your SPM and the stroke length, because you cannot suddenly change your uh, pump diameter. So mainly you have to play with the SPM and the stroke length. Previously, uh, we saw that the last number uh, in the Pump designation is the maximum stroke length, right? So uh, in your uh, unit, you will have a crank arm. Uh, this is your crank arm. And then you may have four or three holes in your crank holes. Uh, that gives you the possible stroke length. So say, for example, initially uh, you use 100 stroke length, uh, and then you want to change it to, the, uh, to 120 inches. So depending on your unit size, you will need to fix uh, uh, this pitman arm uh, onto the uh, crank arm. Uh, if this is uh, 100 inches, if you want to change it to 120 inches, uh, you will fix it 
here on this crank hole. So this may also vary with the manufacturers. Coming to the SPM, uh, how will you change your SPM? So this SPM uh, will depend on the RPM of your prime mover. Uh, this is your prime mover and the motor, uh, also called uh, the motor. So uh, other than this, your gearbox ratio as well as uh, the shift or the pulley uh, in your motor, your reducer, as well as your uh, gearbox uh, pulley, uh, this is, uh, uh, you will have one uh, pulley in uh, your gearbox. This is your gearbox. So if you want to change the SPM, you basically uh, need to change uh, the diameter of the pulleys. So you are changing these pulleys, right? So if you want to uh, increase the SPM, you may change the motor pulley to uh, a higher uh, diameter or a larger one. And when you change the pulley, make sure that the V belt uh, and the uh, the V belt uh, it is in tension and then uh, these pulleys are aligned because sometimes it takes half a day to change the pulley. Uh, the main reason is because uh, aligning this belt uh, the V belt uh, properly could be uh, very tough sometimes. So due to these reasons, uh, uh, it may be better to use the alternate option that is your variable frequency drive. So this is uh, 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 in this variable frequency drive, all you need to do was uh, with respect to your available uh, prime over uh, uh, RPM along with the Hertz, uh, you just change the frequency, the Hertz from your panel. And so that all uh, that is all it takes to change the SPM. So once you install your uh, SRP uh, or when you completed your well with SRP, the next important job is to monitor the well uh, that is on uh, SRP. So the most common and useful tools uh, for monitoring uh, the SRP well is uh, uh, a commuter survey. Uh, one is the commuter survey uh, that is liquid level survey. And the second one is dynamometer survey. Also, other than this, you can also carry out some uh, the pressure buildup study for a quick identification of uh, whether your uh, standing valve is working properly or not. So here, uh, this is the equipment uh, of uh, echometer as well as your dynamometer. Uh, this is from echometer company, uh, which is one of the most reliable and uh, prominent company, especially for the rod pump as well as the plunger lift. Uh, they are US based company. And on the left, we have uh, a digital well analyzer, uh, the Geostar Mate, uh, which is uh, Russia based. Also, other than this, one famous company is Lutert. I think it's uh, uh, German based. Anyway, uh, in dynamometer survey, we have uh, 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 two equipments. Uh, one is the PRT, the polisher transducer, and uh, another one is the uh, load cell or the horse, horseshoe load cell, uh, which we will be look at later. First, let's see the uh, echometer survey or the acoustic survey. So this acoustic survey has a gas gun uh, with gas cylinder, and also they have a uh, provision for explosion and implosion modes for uh, liquid level measurement. And they can be used to measure static and dynamic fluid level as well. This fluid level uh, measuring uh, may range between 20 to 6,000 meter that may differ depends on the uh, mate. Um, uh, and typically the pressure uh, measuring will range from zero to uh, 2100 PSI. So this fluid level gun generates an acoustic wave, uh, the pressure pulse, then it travels down the well. So this reflects, uh, this pulse reflects off as there is a cross-sectional changes in the area. So these uh, cross-sectional changes 
may come from the colors and the perforations as well as the tubing and curvature, the TSC. And this pressure pulse travels down the well until the wave hits the fluid level and then they completely reflect back and then they come back and then and, and, and so on. So uh, as you fire this gas gun, uh, this gun has an internal microphone and which will record the amplitude as, uh, and uh, the uh, polarity of the reflection uh, on these acoustic traces. And then that will allow you to determine the fluid level. So based on the polarity of the acoustic reflection, uh, say a negative reflection or a positive reflection, you can identify uh, uh, the, the uh, cross-sectional area, uh, whether it's opening or uh, uh, there is a, re uh, a restriction. So this uh, your uh, polarity will mean that an opening in the cross-sectional area like uh, perforation. And for the downward kick, uh, it, may, uh, it means that the uh, uh, restriction uh, in the cross-sectional area. So this fluid level will uh, uh, give you the, the downward kick in the acoustic trace. And another way to confirm the liquid uh, level is to compare between the uh, distance uh, between uh, your reflection, uh, because once the pressure pulses uh, hits the level, it will uh, come back to the top and then travels back down the well like this. It will travel until this uh, pulse uh, attenuated off. So you can check the distance between the uh, reflections uh, to confirm the liquid level. Like I said earlier, uh, we have a dynamometer uh, survey, uh, two types. One is the polish rod uh, transducer. So this is a clamp-on type. And before uh, we uh, measuring uh, the load, we have to fix and tie it onto the polish rod. Usually between uh, six to eight inches below the carrier bar. And um, this is your carrier bar and this is your stuffing box. So this PRT measures the diameter changes of the polish rod during the cycle. And as you know, the polish rod area uh, with the change in the diameter, you know, the portions ratio and from the modulus of the elasticity, uh, the, these loads are calculated indirectly. And another way of measuring load is the uh, load cell, using the load cell or the horseshoe load cell. So with this one, you have to place it between the polish rod clamp, uh, the black one and the carrier bar, uh, because uh, this is where the loads are acted. So this load cell will measure the load directly. And uh, if we compare with the PRT, uh, in the case of the uh, load cell, as it is measuring directly, the unknown or the inaccurate physical properties of the polish rod will have no influence in the case of the uh, load cell. So from the measurement of the load uh, using either the PRT or the load cell, uh, it will give you the dyna card or the dynagraph. Uh, that is basically load versus position, the stroke length. So in the dynagraph, uh, we have two plots, the surface card and the subsurface card. So the surface card will give you the sucker rod loads and then the pump card uh, only represents the load on the plunger, that is the fluid load and that the, plumb, uh, the pump applies to the bottom of the rod string, okay? So the card shape will indicate how the plunger picks up the fluid and holds it and then releases the fluid load uh, on each stroke. And then this card shape depends on how uh, the load changes inside the pump barrel uh, relative to the, relative to the plunger movement. So basically the size and shape of the card will uh, give you the operating condition as well as the performance of the pump. Here uh, we have an example, a semantic dynagram. Uh, let's see here uh, at position one, uh, that is at the start of the upstroke, both the traveling valve and the standing valve are closed. And then as the upstroke continues from position one to position two, 
the standing valve opens and picking up the fluid and because of the fluid load the uh, rod stretches and at the same time the fluid load is transferred from the tubing to the rod uh, the, to the, uh, the, uh, the sucker rod. So this uh, F0 uh, is the fluid load between uh, 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 during upstroke, uh, during down, uh, upstroke and uh, downstroke. And between two to three, uh, that is during upstroke, the fluid load is carried by the rods and at position three, uh, uh, that is at the top of the stroke, the standing valve closes and the traveling valve also remain closed. And when the rod or the plunger begins to move downward uh, from position three to position four, uh, the compression inside the chamber, uh, it will start. So until the pressure inside the chamber is uh, slightly greater than the, uh, the uh, pump uh, discharge pressure, and then the traveling valve opens uh, when the pressure inside the chamber becomes greater than the, uh, the discharge pressure. And during the position four to one, uh, that is during downstroke, the fluid load is carried by the tubing. Okay, uh, here uh, one thing to notice is that we see a parallelogram shape pump card. So this is because uh, the tubing is unanchored tubing. So in the case of uh, anchored tubing, you will get a rectangular shape. Uh, here the shape is parallelogram. Uh, because of the tubing stretch and contraction uh, during uh, load transfer uh, that is occurring during upstroke and downstroke. Okay, uh, so another important thing to understand is the basic loads, the six basic loads uh, and their load lines uh, for analyzing the pump cycle. But uh, today I will be uh, just giving an introduction uh, of these load lines. Uh, I'll give you some material at the end of the webinar. So if you want, I will also provide you the PPT as well. Okay, so uh, here we have the W, that is the weight of the rod in air. And then this is your uh, buoyancy force. So if you subtract the buoyancy force from the weight of the rod in air, we get this load, uh, the weight of the rod uh, in fluid. So the load line will give you the standing valve load, standing valve load line. And we have the zero load line here, uh, that is the starting point. And here we have the uh, peak polish rod load. Uh, that is the maximum load uh, that uh, is experienced uh, during the pump cycle, uh, the pumping cycle. So this PPRL, uh, is uh, do uh, this PPRL is due to the uh, acceleration force applied at the surface, uh, so that uh, we can pick up the fluid, having some fluid load F zero at the pump, and then here we have the uh, MPRL, the minimum polish rod load, that is the minimum load uh, experienced uh, during the pumping cycle, and this comes from uh, releasing the pump, uh, uh, releasing the pump load uh, that is on the rod. So the fluid load uh, carried by the traveling valve is transferred to the standing valve. Okay. Uh, you can also uh, check out uh, Gibson and Swine paper. And also you can check out the Ecometer company technical paper for in-depth study of these nodes. Okay, I'll be moving from here. So uh, from our dynamometer survey, uh, we get the dynagraphs and from their shapes, we can interpret the downhole pumping condition, the loads, the fillage. Uh, so uh, these are the, uh, some of the references of the dyna card. Uh, so uh, even for a single well, uh, the depends on the uh, condition, you may get hundreds of uh, different shapes. Uh, these are uh, only few references. Here I put uh, two examples for the case of incomplete pump fillage. On the left, we have the gas interference. Uh, you see a gradual load transfer of gas uh, uh, as the gas is compressed during downstroke. And another one is the fluid pound. Uh, in this case, you see a sudden load uh, impact on the load. So this condition 
uh, will greatly affect the pumping efficiency as well as uh, it will also uh, lead to damaging the pump. Now, finally, uh, let's see an optimization consideration, uh, mainly for the design guidelines for the surface unit. So uh, once you select your unit size, uh, you can check the structural loading by dividing your peak polish rod load with the unit structural rating. Generally, the optimum unit structure load will range uh, between 40 to 70%. And if it's lower than 40%, uh, it means that you, your selected unit is too big for the well and uh, you can use a smaller unit. Uh, similarly, if, it, uh, if it's higher than 70%, uh, that means that you may, uh, your unit is small, so you may need to uh, boost the size of the unit. And for the gearbox loading, uh, you may divide the peak torque, uh, the upstroke torque uh, with the gearbox rating. And uh, uh, if the rating is less than 85%, uh, that is good enough. Uh, but if uh, the, uh, it's higher, say 95% or more, uh, it's better to, to consider the new unit design because at some point it's uh, going to cost you your gearbox life. Um, and uh, replacing uh, gearbox is uh, 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 one of the toughest compared to replacing other part of the surface unit. And another parameter to consider during uh, optimization includes uh, your uh, MPRL and PPRL ratio. Uh, uh, um, and the general recommendation uh, is the ratio should be greater than 0 0.1 uh, uh, per each, uh, per every uh, 2,500 feet uh, per your pump depth. So this ratio basically gives you whether you are pumping too fast or not. Uh, that's your SPM. Preferably uh, longer stroke length and slower SPM is recommended. And also you should try to match your inflow with your uh, uh, production rate. So you can play with your uh, stroke length as well as your SPM. And finally, you better know your pump efficiency as well. Um, whether we need to reduce the pump capacity, production capacity, or uh, we need to increase the production capacity. Okay, uh, so I will conclude my presentation with uh, some suggested references uh, for anyone who like to go deeper into the SRP. Uh, the first would be your artificial lift methods book. Uh, Karmit E. Brown. I think most of the petroleum engineer was a part of Karmit E. Brown. And uh, the best one would be the Sakharov Pumping Handbook by Gobert Takax. And this will be more advanced and more detailed in terms of designing and selection. And uh, you can check out the technical paper from the Ecometer company from their website. And, and this QROD uh, 3.0, that is for uh, designing the surface unit. This is from the Ecometer company and it is a free software. And for designing Sakharov pumping uh, system, the whole system, uh, you can uh, refer API recommended practice 11L. And also this uh, software, it is also uh, uh, referencing this API 11R, uh, uh, 11L. And I would also suggest you to register yourself in the Artificial Research and Development Council, the ALRDC. You can uh, take some study material or some paper. And besides Artificial Live, uh, you can check out these PENG tools, the Petroleum Engineering Tools. This is a free software. Uh, you can use it for designing your hydraulic fracturing uh, and for your ESP design, as well as your face diagram, the PVT, plot, your uh, IPR as well. So this is my uh, uh, conclusion for my webinar today. Thank you.